Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thankful for life, thankful for the blessings, we're thankful for everything that you've done for us throughout this day. We pray now for the presence of thy Holy Spirit in this meeting. We also pray that you be with Elder Paul Day as he brings the message for the hour. And we pray that for the presence of the Holy Spirit and we ask that you'll lead and guide us all to continue to follow you in spirit and, work, and walk in the way that you want us to walk. This we ask in the worthy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And we're going to ask the Francis family to sing the um, meditational for us, please. Come we the Lord, and let our joys be known. Your in our song which we the call, your in our song which we the call. And that's around the throne, and that's around the throne. We march into Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We march in a portal, and then we Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let all we sing. Who never knew our love, the children of the heavenly King, the children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We march into Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We march in a world to heaven and on the beautiful city of God. The heroes of the of God and sacred seeds. Before we reach the heavenly kings, before we reach the heavenly kings, oh, walk the Lord and streets of woe. The golden dream. We march into Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We march in a world to heaven, we stand on the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound, and let every tear be dry. We march in through Emmanuel's land. We march in through Emmanuel's land. We bear our words on high to bear our words on high. We march in through Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We march in a world to heaven. We stand in the field. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that well, marching to Zion. We all need to march to Zion. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, the Francis family. We welcome, we're going to introduce our speaker for the week again, Elder Paul Day. He's um, the leader of Yobel Ministries. And welcome, the time is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Tuckley Twins. And just to say a special, special amen and thank you for to the Francis family for that lovely rendition my fingers are still tapping on the table um it was lovely to see the children singing with such enthusiasm and and joy wonderful keep singing for jesus keep singing for our lord and our savior heavenly music wonderful it's a wonderful privilege to be here once again with you to share god's word 
This is a series entitled Being a Christian, and that's what we're exploring this week, what it means to be a Christian. I remember my mom told me a story once when she was out witnessing and she was handing out tracts and she gave a tract to a gentleman and the gentleman said to her, what is this and who are you? And she said, oh, I'm a Christian. And he said, a Christian? He said, everybody calls themselves a Christian. I don't want to hear from a Christian. I want to hear from a child of God. And I, and I think I, I know what he means. He wants to hear from a true Christian, not just one in name or in word, but in action and in deed. And that's what we're looking at this week, what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Christ. Today's topic is entitled, as you can see on the screen, Christian Beliefs. Christian Beliefs. And today we're going to be looking at essentially two false Christian beliefs or practices that we see among Christians today in all churches, in my church, and maybe even in your church. Let's just bow our heads as we invite God's presence once again. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sparing our lives that we can come together and sit at your feet to hear another word from you. Lord, please speak to us. Help us to understand the message. And by your grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives. Help us not just to be Christians in word, but in deed and in practice. Lord, may I decrease now and may Jesus increase. In his name we pray. Amen. Christian beliefs. I always like to start with a scripture reading, and the scripture reading today is Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. You can also find the same scripture in Proverbs 16 and 25, whichever you choose. And it says this, and we can see it on the screen. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. You can be genuine in your belief, but genuinely wrong. Today, this is true of many Christians. They believe that what they are doing is right and that they are on their way to heaven, when in reality, they are heading for hell. This is sad. Imagine that. Christians, probably the majority of the 2.83 billion Christians in our world, believing that they are doing, that what they are doing is right and they are on their way to heaven, when in reality they're heading for hell. This is what Jesus was talking about. In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, and those of you who have joined previous presentations will know that this is a text that I refer to each time. Jesus says here in Matthew 7, 21, 23, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. How do we know God's will? God's will is expressed in his word, the Bible. 
Then Jesus goes on to say, many, not a few, out of the 2.38 billion Christians in the world, Jesus says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. And Jesus is talking about these very same people. They were saying Lord Lord and prophesying in his name and casting out demons in his name and what they were doing seemed right in their eyes but the end thereof was the ways of death as I said at the start I'm going to be looking at a couple of false beliefs that have crept into a lot of established Christian churches and are being either directly or indirectly taught. To know what a church believes, to know what a church believes, Don't look at what it claims to believe. Look at the behavior of their leaders and members. I said to know what a church believes, don't look at what it claims to believe. Look at the behavior of their leaders and members. Most churches. If you, if you, I'm sure most churches say, we believe in the Bible. We follow the teachings of the Bible. The Bible is our rule of faith and practice. Most Protestant churches will tell you that. But like I said, don't go by what they say they believe. Go by what they do. Or as Jesus says in Matthew 7, 20, wherefore by their fruits, Ye shall know them. Who is behind the deception, the grand deception, the false beliefs, and practices and teachings that are coming into our churches today? The Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible says, be sober. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The question, the question is, who is behind this grand deception? These false teachings that have been promulgated and spread in our churches today. The Bible tells us that the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. And you can be sure he's on our trail. In Revelation 12 and verse 12, it says, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he have but a short time. And what is he doing? In Revelation uh, 12 and verse 9, it tells us, it says, the great dragon was cast out, that old devil called, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. What is he doing? He's attempting to deceive the whole earth. You and I. 
You know, some Christians have forgotten or do not realize that we are actually in a, con a, a, a cr controversy, a great controversy even, with Satan. And some people believe that uh, or, or feel that Satan is only in the world, deceiving and destroying people who are non-Christians or who refuse to accept the Christian faith. Some people believe because we call ourselves Christians, we are protected against Satan's attack. But I want you to know today that Satan's primary attack is against those Christians that are trying to do right and live in accordance with God's word. Note what the Bible says in, 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 in Revelation uh, 12 and verse 17. It says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. Who is the woman? The woman in the Bible is symbolic of the church. In Jeremiah 6, 22, it says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. The daughter of Zion, God is talking about his people. The woman is symbolic of the church. The Bible says, and the dragon, who is that? That's Satan. The devil was wroth with the woman, that's the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who are they? Who are God's people? How are they identified? The Bible tells us, it says, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan comes into the church and attacks God's people. He isn't on the outside lurking. Yes, he's everywhere. He's on the outside. But he comes in. He sees an opening. He sees the, as soon as the door opens, he comes in. He, he may even be on the platform tonight. He comes in. And his aim is to deceive and to destroy God's people. Note what the Bible says in Jude chapter 4. We are warned. It says there are certain men. And I believe it also applies to women. There are certain men crept in unawares. Crept in where? Crept into the church. Jude is talking to the church. They are crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. What are they doing? Turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. Note what Satan's imps, these ungodly persons in the church are doing. It says they are turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness what does it mean but they are turning the grace of god into lasciviousness so they've come into the church satan and his imps his allies and they have come into the church and they are turning the grace of our god into lasciviousness what does that mean i'm just going to read the same verse Jude 4 from the Amplified Bible for clarity. It says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. And that's the problem. We don't realize or we choose not to acknowledge or to see. It says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed, just as if they were sneaking in by a side door. They are ungodly persons whose condemnation was predicted long ago. For what are they doing? They distort the grace of our God into decadence and immoral freedom. Viewing it, viewing the grace of God as an opportunity to do whatever they want and deny and dis disown our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And this is one of the false beliefs I want to touch on tonight. 
the belief that Satan has sneakily, sneakily brought into most churches, most churches, that you can more or less do what you want, provided you call yourself Christian and are baptized and go to church. This false belief that you can more or less do what you want, provided you call yourself a Christian and are baptized and go to church. Some people call it once saved, always saved. Provided you have your name on the church records and toll the line, do what you are told by the leaders of your church, even though they may be corrupt, and do not cause a rift in the church, you will be saved. Or you might hear some Christians say, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Or I don't need to live an obedient life and keep God's commandments because I am under grace. They have distorted the grace of our God, viewing it as an opportunity to do whatever they want. But the Bible deals with this last deception about not being under the law, but under grace, which then gives us license to do whatever we want to do, break God's law, commit whatever sin. In Romans, 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 the Bible deals with this deception. You know, the Bible deals with all deceptions. If we read and study the Bible as we ought, we will not be deceived. If we open our hearts at the same time and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truths. In Romans 6, 15, note what it says. It says, what then shall we sin? What is sin? Sin is a transgression of God's law. Sin is worshipping idols. Sin is bowing down to them. Sin is covetousness. Coveting thy neighbor's house and uh, thy neighbor's goods and thy neighbor's wife. Sin is disrespecting your parents. Sin is breaking the Sabbath. Sin is committing adultery. It's lying. It's stealing. It's committing murder. And some will say we're, the law no longer needs to be kept because we're under grace. What does that mean? We can then go and murder and commit adultery? The Bible deals with this. It says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, God forbid. What does God's word say? about those people who have come into the church and are teaching such things. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. What does that mean? For they distort the grace of our God into, into decadence, corruption, immoral freedom, viewing it as an opportunity to do whatever they want. Beyonce, she considers herself a Christian. I've seen in an interview where, uh, you know, I, 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 she was talking about her being uh, under the anointing. You see, they believe that, that, that the blood of Christ covers them. And, and so whatever they want to do, whatever life, however, whoever they want to even worship, it doesn't matter. They will be saved. Distorting the grace of our loving Lord. Viewing it as an opportunity to do whatever they want to do. As I said, this is why you have celebrities who have clearly sold their soul to Satan, claiming to be a Christian and saying they are covered by the blood of Christ. This is why we even have or had, I'm, I'm coming home now, and this is the reason why we even have or had 
a pastor in the church that I attend. And there is his picture there. I've covered his eye. I don't want to expose him. And this is why we even uh, have or had a pastor in the church that I attend who is a renowned pop and reggae artist. Even though the Bible clearly says, and my church says, we believe in the Bible and the Bible is our rule of faith and practice. We believe in the infallible word of God. Like I said, it's not what a church says it believes, it's what it practices, which is the true revelation of what that church believes. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If any man or woman love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. How much more plain can the scripture be? Yet my church would say, as I said, it's following the teachings of the Bible, yet it knowingly employed a secular pop and reggae artist as a pastor. Like I said, it's not what a church says it believes, it's what it really believes, but what it does. In Matthew 7, 20, wherefore by their fruits, Shall you know them? This is the words of Christ, not my words. In many established churches today, they ordain women as elders and pastors and priests and, and bishops. And the Church of England is divided over this subject. And many other churches, including my church, is divided over this, this matter. But what does the Bible say? It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what the institution may teach. It doesn't matter what anybody says. In fact, the Bible says, let God be true and every contending tongue a liar. And if we believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God, what does the Bible teach? In 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 3, it says, this is a true saying. It's a true saying. Isn't that interesting? How Paul begins under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by saying this is a true saying, not a past saying, but this is a true saying. I wonder why he said that. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire of a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. I know many a pastor today who's not even married, but they're ordained. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of? Of the church of God. The word of God. Is crystal clear. You don't have to go to university. To understand what the Bible is saying here. You don't have to have a theological degree. I'm sure. That, that, that those lovely children. In the Francis family. That sang that beautiful song. Can read that scripture. And if I was to say to them. Who does that apply to? Who can be a bishop? they would be able to tell you clearly what the Bible says. Maybe that's why the Lord says we have to become like children. Amen. Like children. When we grow up, we become too sophisticated, uh, too wise. We start believing we know more than God. And we can interpret his word for him. The word of God is crystal clear on the subject. If you accept the word of God as read. But you see, Satan comes into the church and brings in modern 
humanistic ideology on equality and diversity in these last days. Why? Because he knows he has a short time and we can see the signs all around us telling us that things are wrapping up. And so as a final effort, his last onslaught on God's church and his people. He comes in with this new, this new modern humanistic ideology on equality and diversity, which runs roughshod against the word of God. And they say what Paul the Apostle wrote here is either not inspired or it's outdated only relevant for his time, or it's not salvific, whether you follow what the Bible says on the subject or does not, it will not affect your salvation. This, this is fallible human beings telling us these things, and the majority are following. And the exact same arguments are used to support Gay priests and gay marriage and gay Christians. Paul the Apostle wrote in First Corinthians six and verse nine Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul the Apostle, the same Paul the Apostle that wrote 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 3, said, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. However, many churches accept what Paul the Apostle wrote in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, but not what Paul the Apostle wrote in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 3. How can that be? How can that be? Which ones, which ones, which, 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 which one of these scriptures are outdated? Which one should we apply? Which one should we ignore? Which one, which one was only written for, for, for his time? Which one was, was tainted because of his own uh, uh, bigotry? Which, which, which one of these scriptures were inspired and which one wasn't? The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all scripture. There's no confusion. Not some scripture. Not some of what Paul wrote and, and other prophets wrote. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. is a powerful and important scripture that we need to take note of. Many a religious leader need to take note of this, but maybe they believe this particular part of scripture isn't inspired either, so they can ignore it. But in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, it says, For I testify unto every man, that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Verse 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You know, some of these religious leaders, they will tell you, if you don't do what we're doing, we'll, you know, we'll remove your name from our books and your name will be removed from the Lamb's book of life. Not realizing by telling you such a false thing that is contrary to God's word, 
will in effect remove their names from God's Lamb Book of Life. Many Christians in the church are following leaders and doing just this, just this very thing, adding to God's word and taking away from God's word by saying this is what you must take as literal in God's word and this is what you don't have to take as literal. Opening text, Proverbs 14, 12 and 16, 25, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. So who are Christians to look to? To teach them the truth. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 5, it says study. Study. We have a personal responsibility to seek after and to find truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And who do we seek for guidance and instruction and teaching and for understanding? Not me, not on this platform, no priest, no pastor. Who do we go to for understanding? The Bible says, Jesus himself says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. If you come to God with a broken and contrite heart, if you are genuinely seeking after truth and to know the will of God and to walk accordingly, God's Holy Spirit will open your understanding and reveal to you the way and will empower you to walk therein. The Bible says he will guide us. Holy Spirit will guide you into not just some, but all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. If people would only go to God for the answer. So you're a, you're a professed Christian. So you're in your church and, and, and you hear things. You must be like the Bereans. When the Bereans and Corinthians heard the Apostle Paul, imagine the Apostle, the anointed Apostle Paul preaching. They didn't just take it for granted. What he was saying was true. The Bible tells us they went and searched and tested whether or not the things they said were in accordance with God's word. But many of us, we go to church and we fold our hands and we just take it all in. Whatever is voted upon, we adhere to. The question is, who are we then following? We are warned in other places how Satan would come into the church and attack Christian beliefs in the plain teachings of the Bible. We are told about this. In, in 2 Timothy 4, 2 to 4, we are warned. And here's I mean, this is coming from the New Living Translation. Simply for clarity, my preferred Bible is the King James Version, but sometimes just for, for clarity, and I want you to make sure you get the point. It says, preach the word. Be prepared whether the time is favor favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, encourage your people with good teaching. For the time is coming, and that time is now, when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. You know, I remember several years ago when I used to be invited to churches to preach. I'm still invited to one or two, but you know how it is. Not everybody wants to hear these types of messages. 
But I remember years ago when I was invited and I met, in fact, there's a sister on the platform here. I used to go to her church. And when I used to go to their church to preach, I remember there was a particular section in the church that would just get up and walk out and go into the, into the hall. I remember once preaching in the church and, and the person in the aisle literally or, or virtually turned around their chair. So I was kind of speaking to their back. People don't want to hear. They want to hear smooth things in these last days to soothe their itching ears. People want to be popular. I'm going to come on to that. People want to be popular. And this is why and what happens when established churches and church leaders twist the word of God to suit whatever their itching ears want to hear. What happens when established churches and church leaders twist the word of God to suit their itching ears? The members of the church follow. That's why leaders and preachers have such a, an awesome responsibility and will be held greatly accountable because the vast majority of people are sheep and they don't study for themselves and they go to church and they follow whatever is voted on, whatever is taught whatever they're told they go along with it the majority there are only a few people who naturally agitate or are like Bereans will question and test and people are fearful most people are fit like sheep they're fearful they're not bold they're fearful of isolation they're, they're fearful, fearful of being labeled they're fe fearful of being called a troublemaker and so they keep quiet and they just go with the flow. And so the question is, what happens when established churches and church leaders twist the word of God to suit whatever their itching ears want to hear? They follow. And this is why the majority of professed Christians are going to be lost and only a remnant will be saved because the majority follow the institutions, beliefs and policies and men rather than follow God. Romans, Romans 9, 27, it says, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. The Bible says, Jesus says, for many are called, but few are chosen. The Bible warns us not to put our trust in man. It says in Psalms 146 and verse 3, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. And so if we are a professed Christian and doing the wrong and not living in accordance with God's revealed will and are lost, it will be nobody's fault but ours. Going back to our opening text, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You can be a genuine Christian thinking you are doing the right thing by following what your church leaders are doing or what you want to do and end up losing your soul. And Satan is sitting on the corner watching. He knows this and this is why he has crept into the church and corrupted its beliefs and practices by taking us away from the plain teachings of the Bible in these last days just before Jesus comes. How are we to know if a church or its leaders are preaching the truth? The Bible says in Isaiah 8 and verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, to God's word. You have, have a Bible? Hold it up to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. 
It doesn't matter what denomination it is or however pious the religious leader comes across. If they do not follow the plain teachings of the Bible, then it means there is no light in them. That's Bible. That's not me. If you have an issue with this, speak to God. Seek revelation from him. Remember, the Christian is not saved by following an institution or man. The Christian is saved, according to the Bible, by following Jesus Christ and being true to his word. Jesus himself says, my sheep hear my voice. Whose voice? His voice. His sheep, his people hear his voice, not Paul Day's voice, not no other priest or pastor's voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And this is why Paul the Apostle says, follow me as far as I follow Christ. Follow our leaders as far as they are following the example set by Christ and the clear teachings of scripture. I'm not attained to you. You must rebel in your church and rebel against your pastor and, and, and disrespect the ordained leader of your church. That's not what I'm preaching here tonight. I'm saying Jesus Christ is our leader. And we follow others as, as far as they follow him. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. True Christians, being a Christian, true Christians follow Christ. They don't follow anybody else. It's important to note this. And this is another false belief that Satan has brought into the church to blind people in error and to control them, to control their consciences. The belief that if a church, listen now, excommunicates you or disfellowships you or throws you out, your name will be removed from the Lamb's Book of Life and you will be lost. This is another lie that they use to control you because they know you're not studying and you're fearful. But true love casts out all fear. In John 16, 1 to 3, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you that ye should that, that ye should not be offended. He says, They, Jesus is prophesying now. He says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. The time's coming, brethren, when they will put us out of the church. Whichever church, if we are standing up by the plain, thus saith the Lord. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. And so if you stand up for God and the truth in his word, do not be surprised if you are thrown out of the church or marginalized. Jesus told us this would happen. And this is, this is why it's important that you know these other passages of Scripture. Colossians 1 and verse 18, which says, And he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. Who is the head of the church? It's Jesus. So the only one who can, who can throw you out of, the, of his church is Christ. Because he is the head. You need to understand these, these, these texts. The Bible says, Jesus says, And abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. But what is the body of Christ? What is the body? of Christ. And let me just say this, we cannot be saved outside of the body of Christ, which is the church, the Bible tells us. But what is the body of Christ? Is it the Anglican church? Is that the body of Christ? Is the Presbyterian church the body of Christ? Is the Methodist church 
the body of Christ? Is the Baptist church the body of Christ? Is the Pentecostal church the body of Christ? Is the Catholic church the body of Christ? Is the Seventh-day Adventist church the body of Christ? That's an important question. The body of Christ, according to scripture, is made up of God's faithful people who have accepted him as Lord and Savior of their lives and are walking in accordance with his revealed will. The Bible tells us here is the patience of the saints. This is, this is God's people that will be saved when he comes. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What about the, those professed Christians, you might be asking, who are not keeping all of God's Ten Commandments? Are they part of the body of Christ? Well, in Acts, in Acts 17 and verse 30, that's the beautiful thing about the scripture. It provides us with the answer to these important questions. What about those people who may not be keeping all of the Ten Commandments? The Bible says in Acts 7, and verse 30 and the times of this ignorance God winked at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent and Romans 2 uh, 14 to 16 it says for when the Gentiles these are those who don't have the law what about those who are not keeping all the Ten Commandments it says for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the, the mean while accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. If people are genuinely ignorant or never had an opportunity to, dis to discover all of God's truth, then God will wink his eye and judge them according to their conscience, the Bible says. But today we have God's word. And so we do not have any excuse to remain in darkness and be deceived by Satan, regardless of what our church or leaders might be teaching. The belief Coming to the end now, the belief that you can be a Christian and in the church and believe and do what you like and still be saved is linked to another false belief that has crept into most Christian churches, which is the false belief in the nature of Christ. The false belief in the nature of Christ. Was Christ really made like us? Is Christ really our perfect example? Can we truly follow in his footsteps? Many churches today will say, no, Christ was like Adam before he fell, not afterwards. So therefore, Christ is not truly like us and we cannot truly be like him and this teaching is being directly or indirectly taught in most christian denominations today but note what the bible says quickly in hebrews 2 16 to 18 it says for verily he jesus took on him took not on him the nature of angels. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Abraham was born after Adam. Abraham was born after man had sinned. And he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to make be made like unto his brethren, like us, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them 
that are tempted. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like you and me, yet without sin. The Bible tells us, for hereunto were ye called, 1 Peter 2.21, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. This is what the Bible teaches. Is the Bible, is God, is the Holy Spirit setting us a standard that's impossible, humanly impossible for us to match up to or to meet revelation 3 and verse 21 it says to him that overcometh i will grant to sit with me in my throne even as i also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne many christians and churches today do not believe these bible texts which i have just read that jesus took on our human nature was made like unto his brethren like us that jesus was tempted like us that in the same way jesus was tempted like us and overcame sin we too can be overcomers of sin by the grace of god God, and that we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And so the belief has crept into most churches that we cannot be like Jesus. We cannot overcome sin. And what is sin? The Bible says, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And in James 4 and verse 17, it says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. How do we know what to do or what is truth? The Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so the belief we cannot be like Jesus and know what is true truth and live in accordance with God's word has then given people in the church license to sin because we can't be like Jesus. We can't measure up to his standard. We can't, even though the Bible says we must walk even as Jesus walked, we can't do it. And so if I go against God's word, and ordain a gay priest, or a, ordain a female pastor or elder, or ordain a reggae singer or a pastor, or if a Christian chooses to smoke and, and go to worldly parties and get drunk and have premarital sex and eat whatever they like and desecrate their body, which is a temple of the Holy Ghost, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, then it doesn't matter because they cannot help themselves and refrain from sinning like Jesus as his nature is different from ours. And because they have professed to accept Jesus, then they believe they are covered by his blood of any indiscretions, any mistake, any oversights. And so the reason you hardly hear any sermons in the church about gaining victory over sin is because it is not believed to be possible. It's not what a church says it believes. It's what it practices. Again, this is another reason in some churches you don't see church leaders or members witnessing or sharing their faith, even though the Bible says in, in Mark 16 and verse 15 that Christians must go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They believe that even witnessing is optional in the same way they believe applying other parts of the Bible, like being reverent in the church. Leviticus 19 and verse 30 is optional. It's not salvific. It would not affect uh, our salvation. And even if we are irreverent, so what? We can't be reverent like Christ. We can't be holy as he is holy. We can't behave that way. And that's why you go to many a churches today, not all, and you go in and it's it's a mess. People, children running up and down. There's no reverence, there's no order. There's no standards. 
Because you see, the belief is it doesn't really matter because we can't really measure up to Christ. We can't live that perfect life in Christ Jesus. You see, it's not what a church says it believes. It's what you see. Jesus says, you know a tree by the fruit it bears. But remember, but remember, these are all false teachings that have crept through the side door into the church that I attend and into most churches. And we are warned about it. And so we have no excuse to be deceived. Coming to the end, last text, last couple of texts. Powerful text, Jude 4 from the Amplified Bible. Remember, it says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. Certain people have crept in unnoticed, just as if they were sneaking in by a, by a side door. They are ungodly persons whose condemnation was predicted long ago. What are they doing? They distort the grace of our God. You can do whatever you want to do. They distort the grace of our God. We cannot be like Jesus. Into decadence and immoral freedom. Viewing it as an opportunity to do whatever they want. This is what the Bible says. This is not my words. And deny and disown our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Who says we can gain the victory in him. There is a way. That seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your words today. Strong words. But your words never come to embarrass us, to offend us. But simply to provoke us to, pro to repentance. Lord, help us, like the Bereans, to go away and to study these things for ourselves and to examine ourselves to see if we are truly in the faith. Your coming is near and you're coming for a prepared people without spot or wrinkle. Help us to be those people, Lord. Help us today to be followers of you and to so live that others around will see you in us and be led to glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 The truth never changes to suit the mood. That's true. Uh, um, I'd like to thank Elder, Elder Paul Day for that timely message. It's certainly timely, it's what the churches need, because as you've said, the churches, we need the they're, they're, in, they're in a mess, they're in a mess. And I can remember years ago, I was asked to be an elder, and, and um, well, Linda was actually on the nominating committee, and, and, and the pastor said to her, would, she, would, would I be an elder? And she told him exactly what the words that I would say to her. And I said to him, no, because you've got to change scriptures to ordain a woman. And that's what I said to him. You, you can't say husband of one wife. And he came back and said to me, she said exactly the same as what you told me. I said, I told you. <laughs> I've, I've, we've, we've, we've seen one ordination of a woman and they, they, they put spouse of one spouse, but that's changing scripture. And that, that's not odd. You can't change scripture to suit the occasion. You know, it, it's uh, you, God's word's changeless and... Um, there's so many, so many, you know, it's, well, you've just, you've summed it up, you know, in, a, in a, this sermon, you know, the, the, the state of the church today. It's, it's very sad and um, we know that the shaking time will come and it'll be because people will not accept the straight testimony. So we'd like to thank you for that time and message. There's lots to, lots to think about everyone and... Um, uh, you know, we need to get this right because Jesus is coming soon. Thank you again. We're going to share a song now based on Revelation 14 verse 12. And the Lord gave us this a few years ago. It's called, Patiently the Saints Are Waiting for Deliverance. <laughs>
Revelation 14 verse 12 uh, describes the people Jesus is looking for when he comes to take us home. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And if we get kicked out of our, out of our churches because they don't want present truth, it's only Christ that kicks us out of the church. Um, Amen. Amen. Um, Sister Arlene, are you able to pray to close for us, please? Most certainly. Thank you. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you this evening, Lord, for bringing Elder Paul to deliver such a message for such a time as this. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. The Bible is the sure word that must be obeyed. It is written for our admonishing and our correction upon whom the ends of the world have come. Let us be boldly and go before the throne of grace and ask for mercy because we have so much blind blind preachers leading guiding us let us seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all will be added unto us jesus said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of god lord help us dear lord a lukewarm message may draw many people to their entertainment-driven church, but never to an uncompromised Christ. Rejecting Christ, that means we've decided our own destiny. Let us not choose Barnabas in the place of Christ, but let us choose Christ because he chose us. So Father God, the message was clear. I thank Elder Paul for his message. And I pray, Lord, that each and every person come back tomorrow to hear another message. Thank you. This is our sincere message. And thank you, Lord, and blessings to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for the prayer, Sister Arlene. Thank you, everyone that's joined. And thank you, Aga, for Paul, for that timely message look forward to tomorrow night we do at 4 45 it will be morning prayers and then at 5 30 desire of ages 
12 o'clock midday prayers, so, um, 6 30 song yeah. service, rather. No, no, no song service, service yeah, tonight. tonight, yes. And then at um, 7 o'clock, another town message with Elder Paul Day. That's tomorrow's lineup. Have a nice night and see you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.